Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Is everybody okay? Yes. Nothing to complain about at this point? Okay, it's good. It's fairly beginning, so it would be pretty disaster if you had. But we're going to figure out something, though. And by the way, welcome online viewers as well. This is uh, streaming, or we are streaming this uh, whole event online. My name is Ivan Popolo. I'm hosting this event today. And uh, we are talking about sustainable city, urban development, and so on. So I would like to start by asking from you guys, everyone, that how did you come here? I mean, uh, let's put it this way. How many of you came here either by foot or by bike or by public transportation? Oh, my goodness. All of you. Minister, you didn't. How did you come? <laughs> you had your own car. Yes, I know that. Okay. I actually was supposed to come here by taxi, but I couldn't get one. So thank you for taxi Uudistus. This is a very sustainable, uh, sustainable way to do it. I came by tram, and uh, it was a good choice, considering the environment. And I actually cal calculated my uh, carbon footprint before I came here. There is this uh, very interesting website managed by Citra, where you can give some data, and, and it calculates your carbon footprint. Print. And uh, I actually ended up being quite much below the average, which was uh, surprising to me because uh, I live in a very, very old building in the center of Helsinki, and uh, that obviously isn't very energy efficient. Then I do have probably more square meters than uh, an average person does, and I spent way too much time in the shower. Anyone else has the same uh, bad habit? You know, being in the shower, even though you, everything is done, and then you're just standing there like a moron, like, a, yeah, okay. You just don't want to come out. I think uh, if, if you're just going to wash yourself, like three minutes is okay, maybe even two, but I end up being there like 15 to 20, even 30 minutes and so on. So that's something to, definitely something to improve. Okay, but we are today talking about uh, sustainable city, and obviously, uh, it has environmental, but also social and uh, economic aspects. And the prime questions today are, how do we, do, uh, how do we uh, combine different pillars of sustainability, and also how to do it uh, on different levels of society? These are the main questions we're trying to answer today. And uh, this, uh, before the lunch, we're doing this in English, because we have some European experts here to tell us uh, the power of uh, cooperation between cities. And they also probably give us some insights how to do things differently here in Finland, because Finland is a different country, of course, than the uh, United Kingdom, for example. Then after the lunch, which would be at 12, by the way, I know everyone's thinking of that. What time do we eat? It's 12. Uh, then we continue in Finnish, and then we focus on the Finnish perspective uh, on these sustainable questions. So, at this point, once I, I think we're running a little bit late, so uh, I'm trying to keep it short and tight. I mean, my, my speech, not my physical appearance. <laughs> or tight is fine, no problem with that. Uh, but anyway, welcome everybody once again. And at this point, I would like to ask on stage our first keynote speaker. He's uh, Minister of Environment and uh, Housing and Energy here in Finland. Welcome, Mr. Kimmo Tiilikainen. Thank you. Welcome. Before I let you do your opening words, I must uh, ask you one personal question of, about your personal life. Because, Please go on. Yeah, because I know that you've been doing this uh, zucchini farming uh, during the summertime. That's very uh, true. Yeah. And uh, where did you, was it at your home or a summer cottage or a backyard or where did it happen? Balcony in Helsinki here. Really here? And okay. Actually, I have encouraged some of my friends to do the same. Okay. So it has been very nice hobby. And why, why I did this? I have background. I, have, uh, I was an organic vegetable farmer a long time ago when I was living in countryside. And uh, it's not a, uh, possible to do that as a profession here, but I can have the touch to growth <laughs> okay. with one zucchini. But so. <laughs> uh, can you give us the best zucchini recipe you have that you, that you prepare? There are for? so many of them. So yeah. you can ma uh, make uh, anyone, uh, anything from zucchini. Uh, soups, you can fry it in different ways. You can make it uh, in lasagna or whatever. 
world is full of zucchini recipes. <laughs> Enjoy zucchini. <laughs> do, do, you, do you eat it raw, just like that? Uh, yeah, you can uh, also eat it raw, but it's not that taste. Okay. It needs some spices, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> yeah, true. Okay, uh, I'll let you do your opening. Uh, very, you. very, very best of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a uh, so nice place to discuss a sustainable uh, urban policy, sustainable uh, development in the cities, when we can watch around and look one of uh, the f um, latest uh, growing parts of our hometown, Helsinki, around us. Actually, as a Minister of uh, Environment, Energy and Housing, uh, I will start from the environmental reasons. Why do we need sustainable urban development? Why that's necessary? But then I move on more to the social aspects because why we are building cities? We are building them for human beings. We are building them for ourselves, homes and services. And um, three years ago, it was important year in in international uh, global policy, we received uh, Paris Climate Agreement. We decided on the Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and uh, for the whole world. And one year after that, under United Nations umbrella, we also agreed on new urban agenda. So guidelines for the sustainable uh, city development for the future. And uh, all these uh, important policy milestones have huge uh, importance for uh, the living in urban areas because urbanization is a global megatrend that is shaping our world today. The number of urban population, it's estimated that it's 2 billion bigger after 10 years than today. So uh, that means that um, if we are serious with the Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Targets, most of them must take place in cities. If we take seriously Paris Agreement, most of the activities are somehow reflected or touch what we are doing in cities. Actually, uh, for example, in, uh, here in Finland, 79% uh, of the population lives at the moment in cities. And on coming population growth, the majority is expected to be centered in the largest city areas. Today, Finnish cities consume 84% of all the energy that is consumed in Finland and produce about 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions. All these means, uh, uh, all these uh, details in Finland and examples in uh, global means that uh, battle against climate change, it's won or lost in the cities. For example, these Finnish emissions, I told, uh, many of us may still think that it's the industry and the industrial processes that are producing a lot of emissions. That's not true. It's much more, many times bigger amount of emissions that comes from energy production to keep our homes warm and to heat the shower water and uh, bring electricity to our homes and uh, services. So that's why we take so seriously that, for example, the heating must be done without fossil fuels and we are banning, phasing out the coal in energy production and it touches living in Helsinki, Espo, Vanta and some other uh, cities. Um, but uh, to take the global perspective to this, we have this two degree target under Paris Climate Agreement. To keep that two degree target alive, scientists can calculate the amount of CO2 that our atmosphere still stand. So how much CO2 emissions we can emit to atmosphere to keep the two degree target alive. And, uh, when we are comparing that amount of possible CO2 emissions to the CO2 emissions when we are producing concrete, steel, plastics, 
or aluminium, the main materials for building and construction. The estimated growth of uh, production of just these four main raw materials, emissions of them will be higher than the allowed carbon budget for the whole world. That means that it's not only the energy production that we must uh, phase out the emissions and uh, re uh, convert to the renewables. It means that we definitely need circular economy so that we can circulate non-renewable materials, not just produce new, 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 new things. And we also must replace some non-renewable with renewable ones. Concrete, we have to replace part of that with timber. That's the reason why we are promoting wooden building. Well, okay, but uh, sustainable uh, urban development is much more than these environmental aspects. These are necessities that we must keep in mind. But when we have a, a prepared a national action plan for sustainable urban development, we have focused a lot to living of people. We build cities for human needs. We need homes, we need services. And uh, by bringing this sustainable urban development to the discussion, uh, I wish that we can change the very old-fashioned uh, discussion concerning urban policy that is uh, that we have done in Finland for decades. We have focused on is the growth rate of cities too slow or too rapid? Who cares? The growth rate of cities is just perfect if the quality of the growth is suitable. And the quality of the growth, who determine is the quality of the growth good or bad? The citizens that are living in cities. That's why a very important aspect in sustainable urban development is healthy cities. Clean air. Clean air outdoors and indoors. Healthy city means that we have also opportunities for recreation. We need parks and uh, forests near us. And if the density of the city is too high to have a parks in every 200 meters, then we have to build the green environment over the tops of the buildings, if nothing else. So this, uh, that we feel good in cities, it's very important. But then the social sustainability of the cities is also very important from the human uh, perspective. What's social sustainability in cities. First, we must can afford to live in cities. The ex expenses, the costs of living, the price of buildings, the rents. Can we, can, can we afford to pay our rents or buy buildings? We must keep the prices at a, a bearable level. Then, how do we feel? Do we know our neighbors? Do we say hello to our neighbors? Do we have any common activities in, for example, in the area like Jatkasari? Do we meet people from uh, different age groups or different social groups in our daily living? Or are we separating from each other? The students there, old age people there, people who have rental houses there, and who own their houses there. No, that's not the case. Social sustainability means that we have different forms of, uh, of homes and uh, different uh, people from different age groups and social groups at the same area. The more heterogeneic the population in the area is, I would say that it's uh, more sustainable to any kind of challenges in our society. Okay, so this National Action Plan, uh, what are we going to do? The idea is that the government can't decide 
what kind of cities are built, what kind of living people are living there. No. But we can boost, we can accelerate uh, processes or catalyze and support activities that create that kind of cities that we can call sustainable. It's very important, uh, all the decisions made at the local level, the building the networks between uh, cities so that we can learn from each other. This kind of things we can boost from the government's side. And that's the idea of the National Action Plan, how we are going to reach more sustainable urban development in Finland. So, socially inclusive, healthy cities that are low carbon cities and smart cities as well. Many of these problems uh, or targets I have described Digitalization, now I said the word, I hate that word, but I need to say it again, digitalization. And modern technology, they uh, bring us tools to take better care of environment, to wiser use of energy, and so on and so on. But they can also help in the social and healthy aspects of um, sustainability. We must take these modern tools, but uh, uh, more than anything else, we need communication between people. We, it's not that Minister for Housing or some scientist is telling that this is the right way, this is the right direction. We must ask people what's the right direction, what do people need, and then try to develop that kind of sustainability aspect. Okay, now I think that uh, I have finished my time. Is it true or not? Uh, yes. Yes, it's true. <laughs> that, uh, I was afraid of that. <laughs> but to wrap up this, first, to make good policy, we need vision and target. And the Paris Agreement, Agenda 2030, they give us target. Then... We, the good policy must be comprehensive, it must be inclusive and participatory so that great number of stakeholders can participate and tell their opinions. And finally, good sustainable policy, it feeds innovation and profitable business. This is a very important part. Without business doing, going to the same direction, we can't uh, reach the sustainability goals. But uh, this business and market uh, perspective, I let it for the later seminars. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Minister. And uh, just to let you know that we will... Uh, continue with the panel discussion after after the keynote speakers have made their appearances. So Kimo Tiilikainen will join us there as well. Uh, at this point, uh, Harri Tuomala from Asuntomessut, are you here? Okay, you are there. So I will ask you to do some do some words here. I'll, I'll just let you speak. And thank so. you. Uh, good morning to everyone, and humble thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Harri Tuomala. I'm coming from the Finnish Housing Fair. And I'm most happy to see the room so full of very competitive people uh, talking about sustainability and, in uh, general, talking about life. The Finnish Housing Fair, it's pretty much about life. We are a non-profit organization with just one goal in our operation, and that is finding new things that could improve and push the sustainability, a good life, and being a good person forward in Finland. And today we have the Atkasari area just behind us, actually, in that direction, with more than 300 events about uh, seeing, feeling, discussing, measuring, learning uh, about good life. It's not only about housing, it's not only about, about energy, it's not only about traffic, but it's in common, it's about life. And this is something new for us as well. Uh, even though our name is Housing Fair, the fair is not important. It's about trying new things and to learn and to test and to measure with partners. It's with universities and a humble thank you for the Ministry of Environment with being with us today and to being able to set this, let's say, event up in Yatkasari. 
But that's about it. We are trying new different methods in order to give the opportunities to different kind of parties to test out and to learn and to bring their alternatives and solutions to the market. And this is, in a nutshell, what we are doing. We are trying to find all the actual, let's say, tools and methods to push the development forward. Sustainability is not a choice, it's a platform. And that is why we need pilots and we need learnings and we have to use all the, let's say, available information and knowledge to go fast forward. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Harri Tuomala. And now, I probably have to mention that I, even though I said that I spent too much time in the shower, I forgot to brag about that I don't have a private jet, for example. How about that? I don't need me either, or uh, I don't have a car, so that balances it out. I can, I can take time in the shower a little bit more. Uh, so we continue now uh, our two, three different uh, keynote speakers from, European, uh, from Europe. They give us European uh, perspective on these questions. And uh, first of them is Wolfgang Teubner. Welcome on stage. Wolfgang, you are from uh, Germany. And, uh, uh, regional director at the ICLE, and you've been working with sustainability questions and uh, city cooperation for more than 20 years, so you have pretty, pretty deep understanding of these questions. Uh, we just heard about Kimmo Tiilikainen uh, farming zucchinis at, his, uh, at home in the, in the balcony, so do you have any similar hobbies yourself? Well, I'm... I, 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 I would like to, but I, but I have only, only uh, herbs. On herbs. My, on what my sort of balcony. herbs? <laughs> well, okay. Chives, no, no, nothing to smoke. No, no zucchinis, <laughs> okay. But no you smoke can buy herbs. them from the shop, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you, and uh, I'll let you do your uh, presentation. Well, I, I buy them on the market, not from the shop. Yes. Regional true. products. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I was introduced uh, already, so um, yes, I'm working in this topic for indeed more than 25 years now, and uh, which uh, also has sort of some impact on, on how I, I have few certain things, and maybe I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a bit more critical than, than the average person on, on, on some of the issues. So what I will try to do is, in the, in the first half, I would like sort of to map out a bit where we, where we are in terms of um, you know, European networking, also regarding Paris, regarding um, all the topics that have been mentioned, SDGs, uh, 2030 agenda. And in the second part, I would like to potentially mention a few points or, or paradigms why things maybe don't work and that we have to change it and that might also refer maybe to the strategy that is developed here. So I guess this is, is this the, uh, yeah, the, green button. the green button? Yeah. No, doesn't work. Ah, no, here we go. So, I mean, as the minister already mentioned, since 2015, we have the SDGs. So we have 17 goals and 164 targets. And of course, a lot of cities are now standing there. What are we doing with all that? By that, we forget also that this is basically not for cities. This is actually for national governments. This is the goal number 11, where we all like to refer to. Creating sustainable cities and communities is a task for, local, uh, for national governments and not in the first place for cities. Of course, cities take this up, but of course, uh, they, are, they have to challenge their national governments because it's their task to basically create the reliable and supportive frameworks for them. Second part is, of course, saying, do these new goals lead to new ambition? Well, currently, I would actually like to put a question mark to that. And this has also to do with the fact that these are qualitative goals. These are global goals. And uh, so the, they are not necessarily Im immediately uh, asking for new ambition. So they are just 
asking uh, that, that you know there are reports, there there are things implemented, they are created, but they are not in any way you know linked to num numeric values. They have to come up and to be developed again, of course, by the national governments. Now, if you see what you, uh, local governments and national governments are facing in Europe, this is kind of the environment. I'm sorry for some things that is due to formatting, but, but I mean it's also basically adding to the confusion that we uh, actually face. So if, I, if we put some up, I mean, we of course are very much coming from the, the European Sustainable Cities and Towns process that we have basically started 94 in Aalborg. I think a lot of Finnish cities have been very active in that. They have developed local agendas in 2004. Uh, the Aalborg commitments were coming up. If we look back in 2004 and compare them to the sustainable development goals today, you might see that there is not so much difference. So it's basically uh, 14 years back. We had already kind of a framework which was, of course, less official, not necessarily supported by national governments around the world, not even in Europe. It was basically a bottom-up initiative from local governments, but it was already more or less there. Then, of course, we have uh, the Covenant of Mayors, which is basically also supported by the European Commission, bottom-up, top-down mix from European Commission, has 7,000 cities committed to develop sustainable energy action and climate and action plans, and it is also uh, linked to the EU goals. So now we are, of course, approaching 2020, new signatories would have to commit to the 2030 goal, and we already see that cities are starting to struggle with that. So there, there is much less cities now committed to the 2030 goals than have been committing to the 2020 goals. And I think this is also to do that. Uh, they, first of all, by the national governments, of course, the 2040 goals are scaled to, to the national, I would say, ability to maybe achieve them, so there are different goals for different countries which then match up to the European uh, goals, uh, while on the local level everybody would have to commit to the 40% and <coughs> 30% and so on in terms of renewables, uh, climate gas, uh, greenhouse gas reduction and so on. So then of course we have the EU urban reference framework, we have a lot of more mobility packages and so on and so forth. And of course, all these activities have their subnetworks. We will have a speaker, I think, from Urbact later on, which is also a very kind of important initiative, also creating, of course, their own network structures. Um, we have, of course, uh, um, the urban agenda. Then, of course, also in the, in the field of smart cities, because I think this is a topic that is particularly vivid also in, in Finland. We have the Smart City Lighthouse projects, which in principle also have a very good um, replication mechanism, uh, you know, with building small networks around the, the so-called lighthouse cities that are really implementing their programs in terms of bringing smart technology to improve uh, energy, housing, and mobility, mostly. Uh, with the help of smart technology, and then they have basically follower cities, and they have normally a wider circle of cities that are also uh, trained in the course of workshops, uh, study visits, and so on and so forth. So you see there is a myriad of activities ongoing to support, in principle, sustainable urban development. Now if we go back, what, what we have is, in principle, we, we would like to see, of course, a kind of streamlined agenda and what we what we would need is to oh it's getting stuck ah here it comes basically the the, the national governments and the, from the global level we would see legislation financial means communication and regulation in a streamlined way supporting basically the paris agreement and the united nations uh, sustainable development agenda down to the local level to create really an encouraging and supportive framework. And on the other hand side, of course, we see that the need is that we get uh, reporting, extraction of information, which means 
also I think this is in part of the, of the strategy here, good practice, you know, learning, mutual learning, but also monitoring what is really happening, what are we really achieving. So now uh, I'm going back again, if that's possible, yeah. Uh, what we see is in Europe currently that only, I mean, from the, from the European level regarding SDGs, there is, honestly speaking, from my point of view, not a lot. There is no common strategy. It's not part yet of the EU strategy. Well, we have, we have seen a report, but that was uh, basically produced by the statistical office and was just reporting what was there, and they just put the indicator. There was no bottom-up top-down interaction really regarding the SDGs. So what we see that there is action in some countries. Um, in Belgium, the Federal uh, Development in uh, Sustainable Development Institute, they had a program called SDG Voices to basically uh, motivate people, uh, you know, and in cities, citizens, to basically make them aware about the SDGs, to create actions. We have also some cities like Hent, they do, uh, you know, a lot of work in, in mobilizing, but they have, for example, only decided to pick five SDGs on which they work. We have the Netherlands that try to include it in their national uh, strategy because also they have a quite, I would say, still strong top-down approach to their uh, local governments. In Germany, we have an interministerial council for... Uh, urban development, so there are all ministries around the day table, and uh, it's also uh, based on policies developed by the National S uh, Sustainable Development Council, and we are also one of the, we are a member of that council, but we are also a supporting consultant organization for, for that council, and they try to basically harmonize sustainable urban development in Germany, also to develop uh, common indicators, reporting, and to, to bring them to the local level. And uh, then, of course, uh, we have Sweden, but that I'm not speaking about, because there is a speaker who is much more knowledgeable than, than I am. And um, then, of course, there are uh, regions that are active. There is, for example, North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany that has a quite uh, a good program in bringing SDGs to the local level. The Basque Country, who has already that has already a very strong sustainable development reporting. They are basically streamlining now, of course, what they do anyway with local governments in in, in sustainable development and with the uh, SDGs. Uh, and in the Netherlands, we have also basically a multi-stakeholder uh, system development uh, goals charter. So if you, if you go there, uh, SDG charter in the Netherlands, they have basically, uh, this is industry, science, uh, local governments, everybody involved. And these are just a few uh, spotlights sort of uh, what is going to happen. However, what we see is mostly that it's not, and that's bringing me back to the new ambition, that we will see a lot of you know, new ambition. It's mostly trying to see what is there and to somehow you know, create a reporting structure, indicator structure that is somehow uh, fitting also the structure of the sustainable development goals. Uh, I think the main difference that we see is maybe in Sweden, but <laughs> that, that, that again uh, uh, is something that I, I, I leave to my uh, following speaker. So what we try to do is in the European Sustainable Cities and Towns campaign at the last conference to say, okay, well, we have Paris, we have to, why is it going by itself? Uh, we have, that's what it wants, okay. This. This is basically, we have the Paris Agreement, we have the SDGs, but we can basically bring them back into 10 major agendas that can be addressed by local governments. So decarbonization, urban mobility, biodiversity, climate change, adaptation is here, water resources, air quality, and so on, local economic development. But we also said, in principle, it is needed that we change the way we proceed. So this is, this is the way we do we do uh, uh, politics on the local level. And first of all, we say uh, 
the transformation is not only, you know, we, we, we talk a lot normally about technology. We, we are getting more energy efficient. We have all these technologies that solve our problems. It's just not doing what I want, okay. But we have also basically the socio-economic arena. I think this was addressed by the minister as well. I mean, we have, we have social issues. We have obviously... Uh, imbalances in our societies that create uh, uh, also sometimes political challenges for us and, and I think we see that currently in many countries around Europe and of course we have to look into socio-cultural transformation because this is affecting our lifestyle mostly you know what is what is the culture in our societies what are we doing are we taking long showers are we using big cars are we flying a lot you know this is all you know the way we live Sort of, you know, the, the way we, we create our life. My young colleagues, for example, I mean, their network of friends is all around Europe because they, they're born and grown up in the time of cheap, cheap flying. They have, you know, this is a, a range extender. You know, when I spend the, the weekend with friends and go over with the bike, they have been in London to visit their friends with a cheap flight. So that's, that's just sort of, you know, these things that we have to really think through. And, of course, we said there are some ways to do it. So the, the, the problem is also sometimes how we interact. So for me, this is also linked to the term of responsibility. Going back again. So this is, this is the, the point how we interact with our citizens. What kind of responsibility do they take? What do we allow them to do? How do we support them to do? What is the, the difference between, or where is the, the line between public tasks and private task. Where is the, the the line between funding? You know, how much can people get engaged in doing things financially, economically? I mean, we we see it in the field of renewable energy. There is a lot of decentralized investment, a lot of citizens' investment. This can, of course, potentially be extended to others. We see it now coming up in the social housing arena with a lot of cooperatives and others. The way we engage people, but also in shaping things, sort of public space, you know, there's a lot of interesting projects going on, also in decision making. I mean, uh, there, there are still experiments, but there is, there is in, in Spain, for example, in, in the bigger cities, particularly those that are really ruled by citizens' movements like Barcelona, Madrid, uh, Valencia, they have these big decision making platforms, it's going far beyond, for example, participatory budgeting, but it's really sort of, you know, making project proposals, vote on these project proposals, there is money tagged to these uh, once they are, they are approved, so, so to really take citizens along in the development, but also making them responsible. Because, I mean, currently we have this big divide between politics, that's like a, a service institution, and the private sector who is basically walking away from politics and blaming politics for every, everything. So, going back to maybe why it doesn't work <laughs> or why things do not work. I mean, in principle, when you go back to 1992, Rio, I mean, th this is a very simple, basic thought. We have this red line, which is the global boundaries. And for climate, they are currently defined at 2 degrees centigrade or less. So which means this translates basically in a, in a greenhouse gas emission budget per capita of two tons. So I think nobody here in this room is within that budget, including myself, of course. And then, of course, we have currently the blue line. So what we do is basically we permanently go beyond the boundaries. So that is... That is why, because we, we always need more, we have more people on the planet, but also our, our motivation is growth. So we have more that we then can distribute, so there is a bit more for everybody and not, not the same amount for everybody or the same, but we have gone beyond that. So at the same time, we have a com competitive distribution agenda. So in principle, when you, leave, when you read, I mean, this is when you read European Commission documents, you have normally two words in every document, competitiveness, growth. But competition is a very aggressive agenda. <laughs> because only one, you know, it's about winning. It's about being the best. It's about being the biggest. The point is what we currently see, and I think this is a sub 
subtext of all this, uh, you know, nationalism, you know, going down, you know, conflicting issue is, of course, we have an, a, a subtle notion that there is something like this red line and that there is maybe not enough for everybody to live like we live, but nobody wants to give up. And everybody thinks that, of course, if we protect ourselves, maybe we can go on like this and keep the others out. We are better off if we do it for ourselves. Second measure is, of course, if you look at the SDGs in a broader sense, the ecological footprint. And there, of course, we have either a footprint of one or the, the, the Earth, so-called Earth overshoot day, when we have consumed all the re uh, renewable resources, would be on 31st December. If you look here, that is what we, where we are. So currently, we are basically in August. When you go back 92, we have been still in October. 2002, Rio plus 10, we have already been in September. Now we are basically in August, and if we continue like that, we will soon be in July. That means we are consuming about 1.7 Earth. This is simplified, we can, you know, this is not necessarily that we have to have a scientific, but it doesn't matter whether it's 1.4, 1.8, it's too much. Point is, this is, for example, one of the, the issues that I see as one of the causes. What we say is this describing sustainability. You know, in the introduction we heard, okay, this is economy, social, environmental. In fact, it is, when you look at, at the previous one, well, environmental is basically a non-negotiable boundary. You can, of course, say, okay, well, we, we, we have a different situation in Finland, but this is, this is what usually happens. The economy always wins. When we come to conflicts between the three areas, normally the economy wins. Then come the social needs and the environment is the one that is basically losing. And this is why I do not think that this is the right way to describe sustainability. We say, I mean, this is, don't have to, but this is maybe, maybe, you know, this is reflecting at least better. Basically, we base our out societal output mostly on, on uh, resources and ecosystem services, natural resources. We extract and create output. We put in capital, we put in labor, classical economy, we have tax. So, and the most, all the distribution questions we are discussing up here. So all, everything that we can produce is what we can distribute. And the availability of natural resources to us, which are fueled, of course, by, by, by also by capital input, is in principle what we have available to distribute. And if we exclude people from natural resources, we exclude them from opportunities to develop. This is sort of... A, then the second one is we have to produce more with less. So which already includes the more. So we always need more. So what, what happens is, of course we produce more with less. We have become more efficient. But the, but the point is that at the same time, we always maximize the output for consumption. And we always increase the consumption. And I mean, if you look at the current development you know, we have, we have a good economic development in Europe. We have a good economic development in Germany. Germany is not meeting its 2020 climate goals. Germany is actually currently emitting more. It's growing again. So, of course, we have become more efficient. In, in, I checked up 2014. Germany had a lower footprint per capita than Finland. <laughs> Ecological footprint. But still, we are far, far beyond, you know, the global, the global limits. So, and the point is that, of course, with growth, we are, we are basically eating up permanently the, 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 the efficiency, but nobody dares to talk about sufficiency. Nobody talks about, not to mention less, but we are not even able to talk about a, a stable situation. And this is, this is I think, the, 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 the big you know, elephant in the room. We all talk about, we never talk about this, because we always think, okay, more, and this is to do because we have present needs or present wants that we always trade against the future. And always we, the present wins against the future and the here dominates about the elsewhere. 
You know, we talk about global responsibility, but ultimately we are focusing on, on us. And, and we have, of course, this is fueled by, you know, the, also by new technology. We currently see, you know, immediate need satisfaction is fueled. You know, we have a 24-7 mentality and we, we have a I want it here, I want it now mentality. You know, if you look at companies like Amazon, they have now two, two hours instant delivery. Some people might think this is progress. But it's basically, I want it, I get it now. And this is creating a lot of problems socially. If you look at the, 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 the social and wage structure of a company like that, packaging waste, we just had a big, we have a big discussion in Germany because we recycle a lot, but also we are the, the ones who produce the most packaging waste. So, so this is all you know, where things go, my, in my opinion, fundamentally wrong. And it's very hard to fight this from the local level. It's very hard. So I think there, you know, the paradigms are an obstacle. And if we don't get to a societal discussion about these paradigms, then we will not most likely achieve what we like to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions uh, to our experts, arising from their keynote speaks or uh, wherever, whatever you have to ask, there is possibility to do it. I think we, ha we have a microphone there in the audience, or if, even if we didn't, uh, this is so small area or the room is so small that you can just say it out loud. But we will continue now to our next uh, keynote speaker. She's uh, Monica von Schmalenze. You're here, there, okay, thank you. Good from Sweden, and uh, she's a chairman for the Council for Sustainable Cities in Sweden. Welcome. You are, uh, you are an architect by your uh, profession. Yes. How is it when you are designing new buildings, how do you take sustainability into account? Uh, very high up, I would say, and it has changed a lot uh, since I started to work many, many years ago, because at that time, <coughs> sustainability was at the lowest point of the agenda now is you can always start to pose the question how do we make this building sustainable and then there will come up different solutions so it has when, been when a was, big when, change. When did you start? When was that? Do you want to know? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I graduated uh, 1982 so I've been in business for many years. So it's like a in 30 years has happened this change? Uh, yes, yeah, very okay. much, very okay. much. So I'm very happy about that. Okay. I'll let you do your presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this venue, and this fantastic view. I just love Helsinki. It's one of the best cities, I think, in the world. And it's so nice to be up here, because when you're up and become like a bird, you can look down and you can also see everything that has, the city has achieved, but also, of course, the challenges that we go through. Uh, my name is Monika Forsmalice and I'm an architect and I'm also the, uh, the president for the Council of Sustainable Cities. And for many years I was also the uh, uh, CEO of White Architecture, which is one of the largest architectural firms in, in Europe. And I was also the chairman and founder of uh, uh, Sweden Green Building Council, so that's why sustainability has always been very high up on my agenda. Today I would like to speak a little bit about the Council and I would like to speak about why this is important and what uh, we can do and how we can do it. So those three words I think is quite interesting. So it was a very nice introduction to what I was going to say because there is a lot of because about why this is so important. But most of all, I think, as the minister just said in his introduction, why is the cities so, why, why do we like cities? Well, cities has also always been the place that we think about when we think about the future and a lot about hope. The cities where we find the love, the cities where we can work, and the cities where things will happen. So this is what I'm doing now. I'm more free and I'm the, uh, uh, this Council for Sustainable Cities is an initiative from the Swedish government. From the, uh, and also it's a part of the new policy agreement uh, regarding uh, architectural policy. And I will talk a little bit about that later on. 
I think this is very important for us being architects and also when we plan the cities. And that's how we uh, uh, design the cities. They have to be desirable and they also have to be democratic. And uh, that's why architecture and planning when it comes to quali quality can really empower the lives of uh, people. I got very interested in cities while uh, going to the Biennale in Venice in 2006. This, uh, the theme was cities, and it was the Richard Burdett, who is the professor at London School of Economics, and it was regarding the social economical aspects on sustainable cities and the urbanization and the growth. And this was really the, uh, how dense cities really are. And I think that's interesting to talk about density while talking about sustainability, because that's a lot about the quality factor and also about how we can make cities become more green. So this is actually the free space in Cairo. It's 0.4 square meter free space in Cairo. And if you think about London, it's like 100 times more. It's even 40 square meters open space per capita. And I think that's interesting when we think about cities to make them more livable and more green. When people come to Hammarby Sjöstad, you have probably heard about that, people come because of these uh, sustainable aspects on the, how they have worked with that in, within the city and how the, this part of the city has been planned. But most of all, people are very, very impressed about the public realm between the buildings. The places between the buildings and that, how it's used for the people and the inhabitants in Hammarby Sjöstad, but also to see how we can use the ecosystems and also the free space to make them uh, more sustainable. And especially now with the, high, with the climate change, we have to use uh, the spaces between the buildings in a more efficient way. And this is, of course, one of the biggest challenges that we do have in modern time. That's the traffic the conjunction and the, and the car dependency. So we have been planning our cities for so many years with the cars ahead. And that's now so a big problem that we, have to, uh, that we have to look at. And now I think this is one of the biggest and largest challenges that we go through. Even so, uh, in the Nordic, we have a, a, a good benefit. We have a big advantage of living close to the nature. This is how we are as, as citizens here in Finland and, and the rest of the Nordic countries. And the legal right of access gives us also an opportunity to see that the cities has to be a new part of the ecosystems and we have to bring in the greenery into the cities. We have had parks, we have had green parks, but even the small parts, as for the minister, I agree at having this in the balcony, I think we have to use these places in the parks to become more green and also to, to, to make them as a part of the, uh, to make them green and to cultivate part of this and see that as a very important tool. Of course, segregation is something that we can't look through as we talk about social uh, uh, environment and, and sustainability. And I think segregation, not just with the suburbs and immigrants coming in, but also to see how do we produce uh, really cities with mixed income, mixed use, and mixed affordability. That is what the mayor of London talks about a lot, Sadiq Khan. I think he's a very brave person and uh, he has a vision and I think this is something that we have to keep in mind while talking about sustainability because it has to go through a leadership that is brave enough to make decisions. He has three aspects when he talks about cities, inclusive, accessible and sustainable. But he also talks about something else and that is good growth by design that he says that planning and architecture and good growth is part of to make the city or the London for all Londoners. And I'm very proud because I'm one of the design advocates uh, from Sweden to help him with this. And especially now, people start to talk about quality aspects, which I think is so important when it comes to sustainability. So, coming back now to livable cities and how we can do this and how we are working with that within the council, I think there are a few aspects regarding uh, uh, how and what, but, uh, but not uh, why and what, of course. Uh, and I think something that is interesting to understand is, of course, to have this geographical uh, knowledge regarding your country and to see how the country is divided and to see how then the uh, sustainable goals, the, uh, uh, the agenda can work into this. 
And of course, this is not so uh, fair when you talk about how Sweden is a long country and when you see the densification of the small place called Arjeplog and you compare that with the suburb of Sundby Bay. There will be, of course, a lot of uh, an issue about uh, what about the countryside and what about the city. And now there's election coming up on, on Sunday here in, in Sweden, and that's even so important to see what will, of course, happen after that. But how the country is organized, I think you always have to have this idea of what, who is doing what and why. So on a national level, we have, of course, the, what the uh, politics can do, uh, policy making can do. And on a regional level, we used to have a very good planning of how we have this regional plan. That's something that we now lack of competence within the regional planning, which is very, very important when it comes to the long-term vision. And mainly, a lot of things has now to, to be decided by the municipalities. And the municipalities has, of course, the power to, to decide, and they also have the, the power because they own the land, so that I, that's why the municipality is so important. But in all ways, I would say that the spatial planning is crucial to make this happen, and that's why even the regional has to meet the uh, uh, local plan, but it has to be also some initiatives coming from the government. And from the Swedish government, there are, for instance, this is just a few examples that we have worked with just recently, and one is the Sweden negotiation when it comes to how to uh, continue to, to develop the railway system in Sweden, and where they negotiate with the biggest cities regarding those, you can see that on the left side, and how they give over land to the state, and the state then can give them incentives that could make them produce more housing. Because in all these big cities, there is a lack of affordable housing. It doesn't matter where you go, but it's a lack of affordability, and that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. And when it comes to affordability, people say, well, you can always uh, have a, a, a social housing that will solve that problem. Yes, but it's more about quality in those uh, areas as well. And we need, of course, to produce new housing that will be more sustainable than we have been uh, produced before. And to, to do this, of course, it has to be a triple helix, helix between the government, the business, and all the sectors, as you mentioned before. This is so important. In May 24, uh, we had a new uh, architectural policy that was taken by the government. And for us, being architects, planners, and I've been working with this for many years, it was, of course, very good news. And the whole idea regarding the new policy is to strengthen the impact of architecture, form, and design in a long-term perspective. And I think this long-term perspective is something that you have to talk about and to, to really understand. Because we live in a world of, that is so complex, so it's very hard to understand those long-term decisions, but also why this is so important. That's why politics are so uh, very, very important. And of course, I agree with you when you, we describe sustainability, but for me, it's not those three circles, though those are important, and even the Brundtland Commission, but most of all is this little girl in the middle. Because this is what this is all about. This is about humans, it's about people, and especially about the next generation. And I think we have con come a, far, a good way on our way forward when it comes to the environmental sustainability and all, also actually the social. We have started to talk about that, but not the economic sustainability, hardly. And I think that's so interesting when it comes to especially these goals. You were mentioning uh, in your presentation about this uh, SDGs and the global goals. I think and I believe and I, I, I work very much with those goals because they are a tool for communication and that's very good to have because these are so many uh, different uh, aspects that when we talk about sustainability and it really helps us to kind of have the same vision and the same picture when we talk about this. So this has really helped us a lot within the council, but also being from uh, practitioners and the politicians. So I think this all together is a very good tool when we think forward. And there was very strong now with this new policy in Sweden are that there are three departments 
three ministers, Minister of Culture, Enterprise, and Environment, that together have the same goal. And I think that's why it's so going to be quite uh, strong. There are, will be, as you can see here now, three pillars. Uh, and uh, I'm then, for this, within the Department of Environment, and that's the Rådet för Hållbara Städer. But working together, we now, for the first time, have a national strategy on livable cities. And I think that will be a very good help for the future. And uh, within this council, uh, there are uh, boards uh, and uh, authorities. Uh, and uh, these boards and authorities should really help to make more better decisions when it comes to future laws and so on and so on. And I think these are the, uh, on, a, on a state level, are those departments that can really help to make a big sh change. Because we know this, and we talk about this uh, very often, that the silo mentalities really prevent long-term vision. And that's why we have to cooperate uh, in a better way, and that's why we have the council. And in Sweden, we have something called grupparbete. This is a long tradition of uh, how to make uh, decisions better and to make them more uh, agreeable. And I think that's something that we can really work with when it comes to this, as we talk about more people-centered design. Uh, and uh, I will just uh, finish up by, by doing, um, giving you some more uh, uh, examples then uh, in how we can do this. Uh, in one way, and I think this is going to be even crucial in the future. And I will give you some just practical examples of that. One thing is uh, we worked uh, within uh, White with, uh, to move a whole city of Kiruna up uh, beyond the Arctic Circle. And that's very complicated to move a whole city, especially when people don't want to move. And how do you do that then? Well, we started by asking people, uh, what are your dreams? It all starts about that. What are your dreams? We started to ask the young guy in the, in the sofa at home and the old lady in the shop. And of course there are dreams about the future, but most of all it's, it's, it's a lot about quality life. And people want to have a quality life. And in Kiruna, people want to be close to each other. They want to have a closeness to nature at the same time. And they want, of course, to live a healthy life and to be able to, 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 to stay there and to have children and to have this quality. So it's a lot about how to define, uh, of course, uh, quality. And most of all, they all wanted this public realm, the square, the democratic square for everybody, and to be able to, to be, have the city more walkable, cyclable, even so people, of course, are taking the cars up here. But this was not the first thing to have cars. It was more to have a healthy city. And the dialogue processes that we used are, are very, I think, very important to really have the engagement from the citizens and do that in a proper way. So not only have the dialogue processes to see, well, this is a kind of show off because this has to be a participation between the inhabitants and the politicians and people living in the city. And we can see that when we are traveling abroad. This is an example from Cairo. In, uh, it's called Go Down uh, Art Center. And that's a, a, a project initiative from initiative from the UN Habitat, but also how can an area really become more uh, sustainable? Well, it's through the participation, of course, and uh, to have this good dialogue with the people, uh, stakeholders around it. But most of all, uh, it is about having this culture as a driving force when it comes to sustainability. For, to wrap this up then, uh, for whom do we do this? Uh, and uh, when we think about this, we have to be more aware of how we plan our future cities. We know now for experience that when we plan, for instance, the, the squares and the public realm, we think more about the boys and the girls. So have the women's perspective 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 when we plan future cities will become very uh, important. And uh, to make them more accessible is, of course, something that we all uh, want 
And I think this quote from uh, uh, the executive director of UN Habitat, a city for all, a city that leaves no one behind. This is a city that will also become sustainable. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Monica. I'm not sure if you are aware, but uh, as Kimmo Tilikainen already mentioned, the National Action Plan for Sustainable Urban Development, it just has been released. And that is a strategy that uh, really provides some uh, real means for cities to tackle these uh, sustainable questions. And we will, or, or I won't, but Olli Annala, for example, will give some detailed uh, information about that, I mean the National Action Plan, later on today. But now we have one more keynote speaker left. He's from United Kingdom, Peter Ramsden. Uh, there you are, welcome on stage. You are a program expert in integrated urban development, shortly urbacked. Welcome. By the way, what do you think? What is your opinion, personal opinion about European cities, big cities like Paris, Rome, London, and so on, are they on a the right track towards uh, sustainability? I, I don't just live in London. I live in Hackney, which is probably the most diverse um, place in the, in the European Union in terms of there would be 50 first languages in a typical junior school, for example. Um, and the answer is no. I, I'm, and I, although I... I, I welcomed you uh, commenting on our mayor, Sadiq. He has a long way to go uh, in terms of becoming, uh, uh, helping London to become more sustainable. He doesn't really have many powers. And uh, so Paris, I also visit quite often because Urbact is based there. And uh, again, they're doing interesting and useful things. But taking Wolfgang's point, if you look at the big picture, what, what is the dial on the indicator really moving in terms of the two tons per person? Uh, not a lot. So I think, um, or in fact, it's probably uh, like in Germany, still growing. So um, uh, we, we see initiatives, and I think this is one of the questions we have to address, is we need to move beyond uh, you know, nice ideas and bright ideas and pilots towards really how, how this achieves a change. And I really like the comment at the end of the last presentation, which is about uh, how we make the city work for its people, but in a new way, uh, in a... In a, in a a more convivial way. I'll okay. stop there. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll leave. I won't be on your way <laughs> anymore. All right. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. As it was mentioned, I'm a, uh, an, Ur an expert with Urbact, and I have been for more than 10 years. And Urbact is a, uh, the smallest of the European cooperation programs, but it helps um, cities and their stakeholders to think about new policy challenges by working across in a, in a, a pan-European way. And apart from talking about the integrated approach, which I want to try and put some flesh on in this brief presentation, I also want to think, uh, look a little bit at how we actually really engage citizens in, in new ways and how we can use knowledge across Europe um, to better inform these types of policies. Now, I think I have to press... Oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm a three-minute shower. Uh, I have grown courgettes this year, uh, and I graduated in 1978. <laughs> no jet, but I did fly here, and I apologise for that, but it's a hard place to get to. And I think I might also have the problem that, uh, that Wolfgang had of uh, things moving on before you press the button. This is from Jan Vranken, writing in about 2005, particularly in the context of urban regeneration, which is where the integrated approach was, was sort of um, touted. But I think I'm going to... Well, I'll, let's see, see, see where we go. Uh, he says, The complexity of the city's problems obliges policymakers to tackle different urban problems simultaneously and in a coordinated way. And perhaps that's one starting point for what we, what we think about by by uh, integration. But I also wanted to, to look at uh, Grohal and Brundtland's three-circle diagram. And uh, while agreeing that the economic has always trumped the other two circles, and that this is a problem in our pro-growth uh, Europe, um, 
I also want to make the point that there are relatively few projects, because you'll in the end start talking about projects, relatively few projects that hit that bullseye of intersection in the middle. And that what we need to be thinking about in creating living environments for citizens in, in cities is how we balance these three. And that's why the circles are still important, because they tell us that there needs to be some type of trade-off between these three. And I agree completely with Wolfgang that in, in, in general we've gone too far down the economic. And in fact, I think one of my, um, my next slides shows uh, one of... Um, now this is a little bit about the EU policy context. Wolfgang already showed you that slide with a plethora of other initiatives. Um, but simply to highlight here in... Well, it's, it's now 11 years since the Leipzig Charter, which asked for an integrated approach and made some lip service, paid some lip service towards more participation uh, and had a particular uh, concentration on deprived neighbourhoods. The Pact of Amsterdam with the partnerships, and I don't know if there's anyone from Ulu in the room today. Anyone from Ulu? It's, it's, I know it's a long way. I think they may be streaming because they're very digital up in Ulu, so quick wave. Um, we're working with them on the digital transition uh, urban agenda partnership, and there are 12 of these partnerships trying to build a multi-level view, but slightly sectoral. So there's one on digital, there's one on housing, etc. And there's a big question there about how the Pact of Amsterdam will bring the different policy fields back together. What happens if you don't integrate? So that's near to where I live. It's about four, uh, six kilometers down the road. Uh, it's London Docklands. What people don't know about it is that it was built with one of the highest tax credit uh, donations by government to a private uh, speculator, the Reichman brothers, ever made. Two billion pounds, so a current exchange rate since Brexit, uh, 2.4 billion euros of public tax subsidy went into that development. But there was no environmental payoff and there was no inclusion payoff. So local citizens in the poorest borough in London, in Tower Hamlets, didn't get the jobs in these shiny towers at all. And they still don't. There's still as if there's a barrier between those citizens. Now, it would have been possible to have relocated the City of London and done it in an inc a more inclusive way. And I'll come on to some of those things. But some of the other things, and I, some of the things that you might suffer from, more than having London's financial centre, uh, urban sprawl. If you don't integrate your policies at urban planning level and think about the car more and all that, and I came in by bus from the airport because I like to see the, so I like the slow route, um, um, and a lot of housing developments, but still huge amounts of cars parked outside these new developments near the airport, and they have a rapid transit into Helsinki. So it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to wean any of us, including me, from our dependence on, on, the, motor, on the motor car. And you'll see in other countries these roads to nowhere that Europe is funding. Uh, unused airports in Spain, for example, where there are at least three. We, we've already mentioned uh, the, the problem of affordable housing. It's totally solvable. We can fix the question of affordable housing in our cities, even in London, which is probably the least affordable, or Paris. But we aren't really trying, uh, and we're not looking at innovative solutions. And we also struggle with this multi-level question. So in London, central government has allowed office blocks to be converted into living accommodation without going through any planning process. Sadiq Khan has no control over that. So when an office block is converted, he can't regulate it, nor can the local borough. There are office blocks which are now offering individual apartments which are 12 square meters in London. Not Tokyo, uh, not those sort of horizontal living spaces you, he you hear about in Hong Kong. This is London, where, and that's what happens when you deregulate and when your levels are not aligned. Now, we talk about integration as if it's one thing, but there's, it's a surprising thing, because apart from Jan Vranken, who wrote this good report in about 2005, there's not been a huge amount written about what we mean by the integrated approach. Urbact has tried to put flesh on the bones of what integration means by describing it and by working with bunches of cities, usually about 8 to 12, on a whole range of different policy challenges, environmental, economic, and social. Sorry, I've gone. I have to go back. Um, 
So more than one interpretation. The, the one that comes from the three circles diagram is about the integration of policy fields. And, and that's, what, um, we, we, that's what we've been talking about this morning. It also very often is used to describe the need to combine soft and hard investments. So a soft invent, uh, investment could be uh, supporting SMEs through finan finance, uh, through business support of other, other forms. The hard investment might be the incubation center that they're actually based in. So that would be a combination of hard and soft. In Urbach, we've tried to also give this more of a sort of governance dimension and talk about three parts to it. So horizontal, vertical, and territorial. And these are useful. They're all forms of integration, but they really describe the types of partnership or the types of alignment that you need to have in your policy area. So horizontal is the sort of original one that people are most comfortable with. It's when you're in a city, you're working on a particular problem neighborhood, and you bring all the actors together to, who, who are concerned with, who own that problem all the people who are part of it. And hopefully you also bring in the residents or the citizens who actually suffer that problem if it's a problem place. So that's a, that's a very easy one to understand. But it might also be multi-agency. It's not just about different departments in the city, and it depends on how your competencies and, are organized at levels and so on. The second one is equally important, and the Sadiq example is, important, is useful to remember, which is that we need to have some level of vertical alignment and the problem for government and for subsidiarity in general is that people higher up the government chain think it's all about them. People in cities obviously think it's all about them and people in neighborhoods all about them. People aren't very good at passing power down. And what we need to have is an alignment that works in both ways, in both directions, so that the voices of cities actually inform national policies and not just bright ideas coming from um, brilliant ministers who grow courgettes. The third is about territorial partnership. All of our cities have outgrown their boundaries over time. And if you look at the functional urban area, the commuting district of your city, it's always much bigger than the, the existing municipality, even in a country which has managed to sort of grow the boundaries over time. And that varies from uh, member state to member state. But if, if you've got a, a wonderful core of your city, which is highly sustainable, and then your neighboring municipality builds a brand new out-of-town shopping center and generates uh, 100,000 car journeys a day, then you're not going anywhere. And so we need to find ways that we can get policies to work across the boundaries. We also have many problems that actually overlap particular boundaries. That might be to do with waste. It might be to do with a, um, a deprived uh, community. It could be anything. Um, and so we need to find better ways of dealing with this. And moving some of the governance up, and we need to, at the same time, move some of it down, nearer to citizens, uh, in some way. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So these three ideas of horizontal, which, as I say, is the most easy to think about. It's what you do every day in your, in your everyday work. Working vertically, which can be a problem. I mean, look at uh, how Trump, for example, has uh, uh, attacked the question of uh, unsettled migrants. And yet, the cities are acting as sanctuary cities to try to, to prevent federal laws um, making those people's lives impossible, because they all pay tax, they work, and so on. Look at how he's attacked the, the Paris Agreement, and uh, yet the cities are trying to do what they can to keep the idea of uh, climate change going. But they're not going to be very successful on that, because if he's making coal cheaper, even if he can't make it, uh, or, or less regulated, even if he can't make it uh, really economic again, it's, it's undermining their, their, their efforts. This is why you need some alignment between levels. So three levels. Obviously, there are loads of barriers, and I don't want to dwell on these too much because our job is to overcome them, but it's worth remembering that all of us at some point have been professionally trained, and we all have a particular way of looking at the world, and we don't always understand it when other people come into our, uh, our corner our policy corner, and have their own ideas. And you can see in cities the way that highway engineers, for example, I won't do a shout out for highway engineers, uh, whether they have um, perhaps dominated too much the planning of cities. And you see in all sorts of cities. I, I, I worked a little bit with the, uh, the city of Seoul in South Korea. 
and they've already uh, demolished one overhead motorway and buried a second one so that, and replaced it with a river. Uh, now, that's a, pr that's a process which is beginning to happen across the world where open motorways, especially along waterfronts, are being either deleted completely or, or re re uh, repurposed. And one of them is now an aerial park, a bit like the High Line. But our professional training. All our European policy comes to us through silos, and then it gets re-siloed at national level. So again, a second problem, and I really welcome, and I, th I thought it was very useful, the Swedish idea of bringing three ministries together with a common objective. Um, the funds themselves from Europe are obviously siloed, and getting uh, DG employment to talk to DG Rego is still a problem after maybe 40 years. And even your local uh, authority departments and their agencies, they all think of their own agenda, their own objectives, their own indicators, and they're hard to move. So those are some of the boundaries. So I've, I've, I've said we need to integrate sectoral policies, um, and I've given the example of uh, too much economic aspect in, in London as an, as an example. I'll move quickly because we don't have so much time. Um, combining hard and soft investments, and again, it, this could be so much easier if, if funding bodies were actually uh, more uh, flexible in the way things happened, and perhaps these integrated territorial investments, which I know you're using in, uh, for, for your ERDF and ESF here in uh, Finland, with an interesting model, um, that's one, one new step for Europe, but it's still much too difficult. Um, so horizontal, and here are just some examples. Here on the right is, is an example I'm very fond of, although it's an old one now, which is how the neighborhood management teams in 34 poor districts of Berlin are organized, working with citizens with a form of local budgeting. And I sort of accept Wolfgang's critique of participative budgeting because it doesn't go deep enough. It's, it's a little bit token. It's only in, in Berlin, it's been between 1% and 3% of the Senate budget over 20 years. But it at least gets people making almost voting choices about which projects should go, go forward. And it's a very, it can be a very important engagement tool. Uh, and we've had, in OBAC, we've got some... You obviously have Paris at one level doing a, a participative budget, 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 but they're Paris, that's another story. But a small town in Portugal called Cascais is also one of the world leaders in participative budgeting. And this is one of the messages I want to give you, which is that across Europe, nearly everything has been tried, and most, most things have been made to work in one way or another. And you have to sometimes look in unusual places. Sorry, I, don't, I know how to start my stopwatch, but I don't know how to finish it. Um, Okay, that seems to stop. So I'll move quickly forward. So vertical, um, I think I've made the case. I don't want to go, go over that ground. I'll, I'll move more quickly. Uh, but but the, the vertical is very important. But I, th I think here in Finland you have a supportive ministry which is wishing to be enabling in the way it, it relates to um, the cities working together in, this, in, in the new action plan. Sorry, there's a bit of an R. And one very, very good example of this was North Rhine-Westphalia, which Wolfgang also mentioned. This was around the question of urban regeneration. And over a decade period, using funds from all levels, from Europe through federal, through state to city, they managed to regenerate 80 neighborhoods across their... their well, North Rhine-Westphalia is 18 million people, so it's quite a big place. But even so, impressive. And they also as a state or a land, they encourage these um, cities to network and learn from each other about good practice. And I think that's the other big role that the, the national government can play as an enabling force. Um, so that, that example is, is worth looking at. OK, and finally, territorial part partnerships. I've made the argument. Um, here on the left is the is Brno, which has an integrated territorial investment covering the wider metropolitan area, even though Czech local government is nearly as fragmented as the French. And here on the right, you see 
the ESPON map of functional urban areas across Europe, uh, with not so many in, in uh, Finland, but, um, but still uh, according to their definition, because you're obviously a, a, a slightly sparse country, to say the least. Now, I've dubbed this co-everything. You'll have heard words like co-design, co-production, uh, co-management is coming along, and co-creation. On the right, we have an Urbac group uh, in, a, in one of the um, capacity building summer schools. And on the left, this is Manchester. And they're working on climate change, in fact. They're trying to change the narrative around climate change, working across the generations. Um, but the point made earlier was that unless we engage citizens, they're going to turn their backs on our brilliant policy initiatives. And with some of these uh, changes that we're looking for, we're looking for people to take shorter showers. We're looking for literally uh, individual level responses to fly less, to try and uh, communicate with their circle of friends in a new way. And it's, I mean, their circle of friends probably happened because they had the opportunity to do Erasmus or to study in another country, but now they're all dispersed across Europe. So how do we actually change individual behavior? We have to co-create in order to do that. And it's more than just participation or consultation. It's about really listening. And we've had some fantastic examples in Urbact, including, um, I think Dutch cities are very, very ahead of the curve in general uh, on the way they manage their cities. And one of them, a small city called Amersfoort, has been working on, um, uh, on food waste, um, but also in a very creative way at uh, asking its civil servants of the city administration, 800 people, uh, to go out and become free range, to become free range civil servants, people who would go into communities and actively listen to what those communities need. And they've really changed the way they work through that. It has an unfortunate analogy with chickens, but we'll leave that there. A quick, because I was asked to give you some inspirational examples, and I think this is one that speaks to Finland, and uh, the digital partnership people have had a, held a meeting there because Eindhoven is involved. This was a city that in 1990 faced the equivalent of a, of a crash because both Philips said they would pull out and DAF, uh, who used to have that uh, um, transmission system based on a rubber band, uh, DAF actually uh, closed down their car plant uh, in, in nearby, nearby Helmond. What Eindhoven has done over 20 years is to not just focus on innovation. That's what they're famous for. They're famous for the triple helix. As, as, and every, every piece of their institutional architecture since 1990 has been based on that concept of combining the public, the private, and the university. And increasingly, they bring the citizen into that. So it becomes a quadruple helix. And I know that some people in, I think, Javascula have been working on that in, 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 over the years in, in Finland. Um, Slimmer Leven, for example, is a project about how to bring emergency services to elderly, frail people who might be at risk in the community without it having to be a police car, a fire engine, or a, um, an ambulance. So people who are literally just uh, perhaps wandering uh, and, and need uh, collecting. Uh, and they created a new, and they created a financial model for this. They're also experimenting with social impact bonds, with new forms of finance to, to, to get things working. Here's one from you, from Helsinki, uh, the Arabian Rant, Ranta district, um, where, again, a nice integration of living and workspace, um, probably getting too expensive now, but that happens, um, and a good combination of soft and hard infrastructure. Maribor I picked out because their integrated strategy has great titles and also has real indicators. And I think this is another message, which is that we've got to get better at how we measure progress. And I think that was part of Wolfgang's message earlier on. I won't go into the detail, but I like the one of grounded uh, Maribor. And they actually have a very uh, interesting circular economy pilot between all their um, uh, utility agencies. Uh, and particularly focusing on, on literally soil. Uh, so ground, ground means something more than you would think. So final couple of messages. First of all, use pan-European and international resources. And I apologize to ICLE for not including you on, on this list. Um, but the Urban Development Network is bringing cities together. It hasn't yet produced that much content 
but the content is coming through a number of peer reviews. European Urban Knowledge Network, EUKN, they produce uh, often thematic reports annually, and they're particularly interested in sustainability and in integration. The reference framework for sustainable cities, again, Wolfgang mentioned this. Uh, it's been parked a little bit, the reference framework, and in fact, when you go on the site, you can never find anything. But the indicators are really good in, in that framework. Um, ESPON reports, perhaps too many maps, but again, some very useful sort of uh, European level pictures of, what, of what's going on. And then of course, URBACT, which is trying to bring um, practice to bear on the discussion and say these things have been tried and tested in a range of different city types, this is what we now know. And perhaps the last thing is that working in an integrated way is actually a new skill. It should be taught in university. It should be brought out, in, especially for people who are becoming town planners or running municipal uh, housing departments or other administrations. Um, you, because most of the people that you're working with are already trained, you're going to need to do specific uh, forms of training. And again, Urbact has perhaps... Uh, made a uh, raise the level with its summer universities in, in how that type of training can be delivered. We need to go beyond this idea of miracle projects um, and really look at what the processes and the governance models are that make this work at local level. Um, and there's, there's good practice is very important. I've produced a fair amount of it myself in terms of write-ups and so on. But we need to actually, we, th there are very few um, it's not miracle projects that, that will make the difference. It's, it's concerted working. It's more like an orchestra than simply a soloist. And we need to use re results frameworks in a sort of much more hands-on way to drive performance. And this was mentioned in the action plan as well. So just a, the final tip then on, on your networks. Keep these uh, challenge clusters small and focused. Uh, so that all the people in them are on the same challenge. Learn from other types of uh, networking activity that other uh, regions and countries have adopted, and I'd mentioned Sweden already here. Uh, Poland is doing some interesting stuff, and we've mentioned North Rhine-Westphalia. Think about what the methodology for exchange might be between your cities. So how are they going to work? What's their product? What's, what's the actual nature of the work they do. The last thing you want is for it to become what the French describe as a usine à gaz, a gas factory, a talking shop. It must be practical and, and action focused. Uh, so bring in elements of transnationality. You're going to do it in, in Finland, but I really take my hat off to you that you can run a meeting in English. Don't do that all the time, but bring in experts as appropriate um, or take your group to see other things in wherever, the Netherlands, Germany. Unfortunately, you won't be able to visit my country anymore because obviously we're off the map. Um, and try to ensure high quality moderation and coordination. They're different things. Moderation is what happens in the room. Coordination is what happens between the meetings. But that needs a budget, and it might need more budget than you think. But without it, you'll get drop-off of the meetings. And if I, if I look at one of the big successes of Urbact, it's been that they've made meetings fun. It's serious content, but they're good to be in. I think most people who've attended uh, our, our EU-wide meetings would say that. So that's just a few tips. And to finish on the great Fabrizio, he says the further who wrote an important report about um, the place-based approach and the future of the cohesion policy for the for European Union in 2009. He says in that, the further, one, uh, further away one is from places, the less chance there is to achieve integration. In cities, you have the most chance to, agree to, to achieve integration, but you're going to need the vertical level, you're going to need territorial, and you're going to need horizontal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ramsden. Now we're about to start the panel discussion, and uh, as we are running about 15 minutes late, I think we have to skip a few things and just um, 
I think we need to do it the way that every keynote speaker, if you can come on stage, and uh, unfortunately you have to stand all the time here now because there are no chairs, but that's life. And then, uh, then Anni Sinemäki, oh, okay, you are there. Welcome. Anni Sinemäki is a deputy mayor of uh, environment from uh, Helsinki. And Mari Vaattovaara, expert. What, what is your title? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in, in English, uh, this. Uh, uh, well, professor of urban geography. Is okay, quick professor of <laughs> urban geography. Well, I guess this works. So, <laughs> if you can all go there on stage, I will sit, sit here. And now I uh, encourage the audience, if you have anything to ask, just write it down or keep it in your mind. And uh, there will be, I hope there will be opportunity to post a question. We just need to wire on the cinema. <laughs> I at least have some okay. question for Mr. Ramsden because you said that uh, uh, the price of housing is easily easily solved, but it just hasn't been done. We remind me that I ask you that later on, <laughs> or you have to tell more I said about it's that. <laughs> it's solvable. Okay. Uh, so Anni Sinemäki and Mari Vattavara, because you haven't had your uh, keynote spe speeches yet, so I'll ask you first that how would you contain global sustainability goals uh, in local le city level actions? Easy question. Is that an easy question? <laughs> to <Okay>. start with. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I've been working during the last four or five years to get uh, different disciplines to work together, as I think very nicely was said in the last keynote, um, to really bring understanding and respect to the other perspectives that, that are meeting each other in a dense and urban environment. So I think we've been talking quite a bit on these sustainable goals, but really going into the very details and respecting also the great variance that there are in urban environment. It's not only dense and, and centered, but it's, as we can see, something very different. So that's, I guess, from my perspective coming from the university that I would like to see happening more. Okay. And by the way, if you have any comments, you can, you can always comment on anything. Anni, yes? I do feel that all the questions that are on the table when we are talking about a global sustainable agenda, they are actually present uh, at the city level. Uh, in cities globally and also in Finland, at the moment, uh, we do consume too much natural resources. But I also think that we have a, a good situation to change that. Uh, in Finnish cities, I would say that our strength is that we have a broad administration. We have the possibility of uh, bringing together different stakeholders and different branches of administration. And also, I do think that uh, it's typical uh, for the cities to have uh, big differences, be it lifestyle, be it income uh, gaps, be it uh, digital divide. Uh, but I also think that uh, actually in cities, uh, leveling those differences uh, and building more opportunities for those who do not initially have so much, I think we do have great uh, possibilities. Uh, and at, at least in Helsinki, in sort of our everyday work, uh, I do feel that we are... Uh, at the same time when we might think that, okay, we are uh, implementing the Helsinki City stra strategy, but at the same time, I have the feeling that we are doing things uh, and trying to uh, find models where we could, uh, at the same time, uh, solve uh, challenges of Helsinki people, but also be inspiration to others working with similar uh, issues. Okay, any comment from anyone else on this, uh, these things? No? No, okay. Uh, now, if we think uh, different actors in cooperation, because cooperation seems to be the right word all the time, uh, what are the roles between those different actors when cooperating? I mean, city, uh, state, and so on, whoever there are. 
Is it too difficult? <laughs> okay, Kimmo, you can start. Uh, thank you. The cooperation or integration at all levels that were mentioned here, horizontal, vertical, and then this territorial, they are all uh, important aspects. And if I start with the uh, cooperation, for example, between sta um, government level and then uh, the cities, uh, the challenge is, like Anni mentioned, just uh, we have founded together smart and clean foundation. A couple of ministries and then Helsinki, Espo, Vanta, Lahti, and so on to tackle the and decarbonization. Yeah, 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 yeah. Private companies and academia is also included in that uh, to solve the uh, carbon neutrality problem, to improve the circular economy smart uh, uh, transportation and traffic and so on and so on. So uh, we are developing things uh, many way uh, in an in integrated way and cooperation. And then, of course, we have this uh, traditional example, Malasopimus, <laughs> that means uh, agreements of intent for land use and uh, housing and transportation between uh, um, uh, state and um, Main, main cities. So we, we do have many kind of cooperation, but there's always need to improve the situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, Peter? Okay, okay. Wolfgang. Uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, the, key, the key point of co uh, cooperation is also that, that, I mean, it's the agreement. So I, I mean, the, the agreement on basically the perspective or the goals that we would like to achieve with the cooperation as well as, as the priorities. Because we have, and, and, and I mean, I did not allude to that that much. I mean, even the sustainable development goals, we have contradictions. So, and I think if we have contradictions between different goals, we have to set priorities and we are often not doing that. And then we end up in these kind of uh, I would say conflicting decisions in terms of regulation and, and in terms of, of also uh, uh, interest. And I think it, this, this, this uh, cooperation is uh, first of all an effort of aligning between the different actors because also uh, uh, you know between I would say industry, private sector, it's about markets. So it's about market regulation because no market is from my point of view, unregulated. And so we have incentive, disincentive, taxes. We have all kinds of things that steer the behavior of market actors. At the same time, of course, we have a, a legal framework in which also local government acts. It comes to, to land use, to energy standards, to all these kind of things. And of course, we have then, then the local level and, and the politicians that, that can basically act and bring together the actors and are really implementing. They're, they're ultimately doing the, the, the more detailed plans and, and, and they are steering the, the, the real you know, infrastructure development in cities. They are basically creating the, 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 the environment that steers somehow the behavior also of people in terms of the services and, and the standards and everything that is, that is available to them. And of course, not to forget uh, science and uh, uh, innovation, because I mean, they have to bring the knowledge and have to basically educate the people in the right way to be uh, uh, able to respond to the challenges that are in front of us. It's like a football team that there are different actors, but they are trying to achieve the same thing, like the, the goal. Yeah, okay. Peter? I, I very much agree with that, but also that um, it, it depends a little bit on the question. So. Uh, if we're talking about, for example, affordable housing or social mix or, or land allocation, in the end, Wolfgang is absolutely right. It's going to be about a negotiation between levels, and um, you know there are problems. I think we, we have to not pretend that everything's rosy in the garden, that partnership isn't just about everyone agreeing with each other. There are times when, uh, for example, in my country, there are municipalities which refuse, which uh, and developers who refuse to build any aff affordable housing into their, um, into their developments. And uh, that means that the supply of, uh, of, of housing that is in any sense uh, able to be paid for is, is too small. Um, and sooner or later, you either need regulation or, or, or some form of contractual agreement. Um, I remember Nicolas Sarkozy, his um, part of Paris, refused to build any and would pay the fine every year just uh, rather than have poor people living amongst them. So 
So that, you know, that's how extreme it gets uh, in that particular regulatory framework. But, uh, but the other side is that the role of the, you asked what the role is of the, dif of the different levels, and central government should play an enabling role, both financially and also um, in terms of uh, creating the playing field and of, of listening. And I think that's, the, that's the, 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 the thing that doesn't happen enough. I think it happens more in Finland than in some, some other European countries, but where the voice of the cities is perhaps not adequately reflected. You have the other advantage here, which is that your cities are fiscally very autonomous because of the, the way the local income tax operates. And uh, this means that local taxes pay for local services to a high degree compared to other parts of Europe. And this is a huge advantage Thanks. because it, it gives your cities a bit of uh, financial muscle, which not every other uh, country's cities have. Yes. Yes, I would like to stress that too, because I think this is something that has to be, uh, we have to talk about, especially here in the Nordic, since we have this advantage of having the uh, possibility within the towns and also to see how the towns then can de develop in, in, in a good and sustainable way. But there is another thing I, I would like to, to say as well, and that is we, when we talk about this, it's so complex, everything is so complex all the time, so we have to kind of uh, go into a small part and to define what do we mean by this and that. And by that, I think research is going to be even more important than before, because I think when we talk about quality, it's, it's sometimes it's very hard to define what quality is, but, but by th evidence, through research, we can then say, well, hey, this is the result of how we did this and that, and this is how we can improve. And through that, I think we will have a possibility to make uh, uh, some decisions easier to make and also to clarify some of these aspects which are normally so complex. Okay, now when Mari, you are there, you are a professor and uh, how do you feel? Is, is research taken into account when making decisions by, uh, by, by yeah. then? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I, I feel very privileged because I've, I've, uh, if you have something serious to say, you are heard easily in this country. And I think that's something very unique in Finland. Even I'm, I really envy the dialogue processes in Sweden, which I think are world famous. And, and I think we could even overgo those because I think we are the only country in the world where really the hierarchies are low. So, so we don't have king, <laughs> and we don't have the old traditions of, of so, hierarchy. Yeah, Saul, rather... Saul and Easter is close to king. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but we, we really have been working together. We are a small nation, and, and, and we don't have those major divisions, but a shared short history. And I think that would build some additional b uh, pace on, on, on the way of how the research is heard. But, but looking at the research as such, it's difficult. It's extremely difficult. I've been working now two years to get the first master's program running on urban studies and planning. So getting the architects really to work with scientists. And it's fun, but it's difficult, because I, as a geographer, think that my world more or less has all the relevant information. And there comes the architect with the ideals of planning and the, the ecologist who is doing his and her thing. So it, it's far from being easily done. It, it, it definitely needs negotiations. And I, I really think of respect that the guy has been working in that field for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's not easily it doesn't happen easily that we start thinking differently. And I think within the academia only, that's what we are really trying to, to but do. But if you look at the real decisions that has been made in Helsinki or in Finland, do you feel that they are based on research and based on science? I wish that there would be such science that would give the answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, um, well, they, they reflect to a degree, but I, I don't believe that I have, as a scientist, the answers. My, what I have is a different perspective to the existing way of thinking, and it should be based on research. So, so that's, I, I, I sincerely don't think that I 
because the solution is way more difficult than my beautiful geographic <laughs> wisdom you, out of any piece of research. Yeah, you just de deliver the facts and then... I, I just they, deliver they, the facts, they, 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 <laughs> I guess, or whatever the discussion is. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, Kimmo. I, w I would like to say that Marie is very good to deliver the facts, <laughs> but uh, it's not only that scientists tell what to do. Uh, Monica raised the importance of democracy. And that's the tool we do have. But uh, it was nice to hear um, that there are good experiences uh, in the cooperation at different levels in uh, Finland. But uh, I would like to raise one issue that um, Peter mentioned in his presentation. You talked about the uh, urban agenda of European Union, the Amsterdam Pact, and the partnerships uh, that was created there. It's important to cooperate over the country borders. So, and I'm extremely happy that there are many Finnish uh, cities like Helsinki or uh, Vasa or Vanta uh, or Oulu are uh, participating in these partnerships. And I would like to encourage more of Finnish uh, cities to take part in this kind of uh, cooperation. Uh, formulas we have created at the European Union level. And, uh, but then it's also important uh, that we have vision for the future. Yesterday I was in Tallinn and you all know that we have the great vision between Finnish and Estonian governments and between Helsinki and Tallinn that someday there will be this tunnel connecting these <laughs> two cities and uh, raising the attractiveness of this uh, area. We need that kind of uh, concrete uh, targets ahead of us, but the question is, how can we do that sustainable way? <laughs> okay, Anni. On, on Just a couple of comments um, uh, about cooperation. I, I think that uh, any institution or branch of government or any actor in the cooperation, um, I think it's uh, still stronger if there is a clear goal or strategic will with that institution, that I do believe that Helsinki is uh, better uh, in cooperation uh, when we have a strategy that sets our own goals, that then it's e easier actually to uh, think with others and learn from others when we uh, have our own picture uh, sort of clear. And it doesn't mean that, um, uh, that uh, of course, we can through cooperation and discussions, some things might alter, but I still think that we would be weaker in cooperation if we wouldn't have our own identity or own strategy at all. And I, I think same applies uh, with responsibilities, that one shouldn't think that cooperating dilutes your responsibilities. And, and I, I think uh, I could use as an example the land use housing and uh, uh, transport system negotiations that we were involved with, uh, both with Kimmo, uh, with the minister, that with Kim. uh, uh, <laughs> there I, I felt that, okay, the cities, we are uh, responsible for um, creating opportunities for uh, building uh, enough housing. And then the state has certain financial instruments. Uh, state has certain financial instrument regarding the transport investment. And then we have uh, certain things. So I think um, good cooperation comes when everyone is sort of listens to his, each other, but is aware of their abilities and uh, their own what we are responsible for. And then then it's easier to cooperate. Um, and, and then last point, uh, a bit from another perspective, that, of course, then there are quite often, I come back to the question of democracy, that I think, uh, if I think of Helsinki and the city's different branches, we really do have uh, things from classical music orchestra to uh, long-term strategic planning. And I think uh, quite, quite a good tool uh, for us to cooperate as an administration uh, is to go and listen what the uh, citizens of Helsinki uh, has to say, because then that might change how we see the different branches uh, of government when we actually go and take the uh, citizens' perspective to different things, because their life is integrated, it's not divided in exactly. branches. 
Okay, one more point on this uh, research thing. As Mari said, that here in Finland, the decision makers really listen to scientists and uh, research. But what about in, uh, for example, in London or in Germany, Berlin, and uh, maybe Sweden? Um, Peter, if I can go first, the uh, one of the problems with with evidence in this whole policy field is that it's still at a sort of early stage in the sense that we don't have really good benchmarks for how much things cost, how much result you get for each euro in different uh, countries and so on. So, and, and I think that's a shame and I, I don't understand why given how much Europe is putting into uh, regional and urban development uh, through the cohesion policy, 300 billion, why we still don't have good data um, and I, I think that that's a challenge that we can we can fix with the help of universities in particular. Um, and then I, I, th I think there are there are big variations in the extent to which evidence is is treated in policy in different countries, depending on the level of populism, both at city and national level, uh, and demagoguery and uh, lies are part of the populist uh, playbook. And so that doesn't uh, work well with an evidence-based uh, policy approach. Um, so, so this varies enormously, um, but you can, you can tell some obvious trends. Um, uh, the, the more, um, somewhere like Germany, where they have the idea of a red line co uh, of coherence between um, a plan and its results, uh, you, you would expect to see a much higher level of uh, at least uh, lip service paid to evidence than uh, than perhaps in my country. Well, I mean, I would, I would put it a, a bit different uh, because, I mean, I think, first of all, the question is which science. Mm -hmm. The question is, are you talking to an economist? Are you talking to a geographer? Are you talking to uh, whatever uh, social scientist or talking to, uh, to a natural scientist? And I think the, 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 the issue about the process is, you know, the, what I said before is, you know, when you have these issues on the table, we are not really transparent. I mean, you know, in climate, we have very good scientific evidence base, and I think this is not by serious people really questioned. And we have we have this goal. Now, now uh, I, will, I would just like to see, you know, we discuss housing. Then the geographer, the social scientist comes and says, you know, we have affordable housing. The ecologist says we have a problem with land use because we are using too much land. The problem then the economist says, well, we have a free market. What happens is there is there is not enough. There is or land is scarce, gold is scarce, so land becomes an object of speculation for the market. So the price for land shoots up in almost every growing city in Europe. Land is going up like you know enormously, 30, 40, 50 percent. And then comes the climate scientist and says, if we, but if we build, you know, we have to build efficient and, and then we have to have quality. So, and then, then there comes the source, but then nobody can afford housing anymore. But then, then we start and say, oh, you know, what are we doing? And the first thing that normally drops off is, oh, we have to lower the standards because nobody is interfering, trying to interfere with the market. So we, and we are not open about the, the you know, we don't create cr transparency about the criteria. So mm. what, what are we addressing first? What are is second priority? What is third priority in our decision-making process? Mm. What, is, what is more important? And I mean, you said, you know, we are people-centered. I agree, but the question is which people? The people of Helsinki, the people of Finland, the people in, of the globe, the people in Africa. What are we doing by making things here to other parts of the world? If we, you know, I'm, I'm not saying okay, this is, but I'm saying you know we are not transparent. Yes, we're it's saying all, it's we were all trading. About values at the end. Well, we, well, it's a question of values and it's a question of, of things that we trade against in these decision-making processes. And there are conflicts, and I think there is no 100% clean solution. But I think we have to create this transparency in the discussions, in the, in, in the processes. And that's where, from my opinion, you know, their science can play a role and there should be a reference. But ultimately, we have to make decisions and we have to make it local and we have to make them now. Okay, first uh, uh, and Monica uh, and then uh, <coughs> Anni. So yes. I think uh, there has been, in Sweden, uh, very, very many good initiatives, actually, 
from many years ago. It started with the Delegationen för hållbara städer, which was an initiative that uh, was a triple helix. And it was an initiative that was came from the government, but it was given to the cities. And through the researchers and through the uh, uh, participation from diff different stakeholders, each city could then ask for grants to present an idea regarding how they would work with sustainability, going from the dialogue process to more sp specific areas. And that has kind of carried on. And I think now, and the reason I bring this up is, is one thing is really true, and that's how I find, because researchers normally are very much working into silos mm. more than uh, other people because they want just yeah. to study this specific Excellent. part. Yeah. So how do you bring up these yeah. smart people on the table and how do they start to talk to each other and not lose confidence in their own field while bringing over some knowledge and to see and to, to kind of uh, use that knowledge in a new way. So that will be a new way, of, or I think, of research, which is going to be extremely important. But if there were no idea from you, Minister, or from you, from, from the city level, uh, to see how, well, this is how we want, want to be, because at the end, of course, this is a competition between cities a lot. So why don't we use that competition, but in a more sort of uh, a more behavioral way or when it comes to more, uh, I mean, how do we really want to develop our cities? Because we all know that looking back from, from uh, where we come from, we are not used to live in cities in the Nordics. We are used to live in the countryside. So we are fairly new citizens living in, the, in, the, in, in, in dense cities. So that's a possibility that we really can use. And I believe very much that uh, when you look back, you see how cities has developed. We have to understand where, what kind of city do we live in now and what is the technology going to do with us when time is so fast and the complexity is so big. So how do we kind of step by step do that? And I, I, I believe very much that it all starts here and mm. by us mm. in the city. Okay, Anni, do you have a comment on this? Mm, just a short comment. I think Marianne Wolfgang uh, described it really well that building a sustainable city is not a question that can be addressed in one PhD and then written a A4 resume that, okay, now we do what research tells because we are dealing with such complex uh, issues. So you, uh, as a political decision maker, you have to choose that what point of view you perhaps think that is more important in this particular issue. But I think for, for a government, uh, respect for research and cu curiosity for it is an attitude that can help enormously that uh, and like in Helsinki we have our own research and uh, city data uh, uh, department uh, we were part in uh, funding M Maris uh, Institute because we wanted just uh, this to happen different perspective to come together and to have a discussion that would then feed us as well so I, I think, uh, and also as a city, that uh, uh, we should be uh, open to research, to evaluate what we have done and find new perspectives. Uh, I think it's more like a um, working attitude and a collaboration attitude than always being able to tell that we did we did things uh, according to research or not. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but then Wolf, uh, Peter, yeah, yeah. Just, just a very specific uh, suggestion on, on evidence is that um, in the UK in an earlier period, um, the government funded what were uh, centres called What Works Centres. And these each have a specific um, policy uh, remit. So there is one at LSE which is looking at urban and regional development. And, and they're literally trying to extract from the data the measurements of how much things cost and how... Uh, what, what's the best way of uh, uh, using results. And then the second thing is how do you create a more uh, vital evaluation culture so that people actually not just do evaluations but read them and act on the results. And that's a much bigger cultural shift. Um, but what work centres are a, a practical uh, idea that uh, in fact came from Jeff Mulgan, I think, who's the, one of the leading thinkers in that field. 
Yeah. And, 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 and really, I think on, uh, after we, we know what works and, and get some kind of scale or whatever, I think it's still bottom line, especially in the welfare state, the politics, they choose where, where, where are the limits and then they can be changed. But it's about political decision, not a research question on where the limits of whatever of these urban perspectives go. Yes. But uh, Wolfgang, as you said before, that this is eventually about priorities, then what would be the way for cities to evaluate what are the most uh, or the best actions to take in order to be sustainable? How, how can you evaluate the priorities? Which well, I mean, I think I top. think this goes back. This goes to back what I goes back to what I showed. I mean, if we for example, I think, you know, I'm, I'm going back to the two degrees because, I mean, that's, that's a bit easier and less complex than the, the ecological footprint. But, but if you say, you know, we know that there will be catastrophic impacts and, and the recent studies that, you know, it's not even sure that this will not happen, that some of the um, automatic, you know, the feedback mechanism and self basically... Uh, 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 accelerating processes in terms of climate change might even happen when we stay be between 1.5 and 2 degrees, like you know, a permafrost uh, and and, and uh, freeing up methane and, and all these kind of things. The poles are actually the ice is melting faster than, than people saw. So we know that, you know, we, we know that, and we say we want we you know to make life. I would say you know in any way possible at any bearable quality in considerable parts of the world, there is, there is this sense of urgency. Now, of course, we all know that, but for example, we all know that, that of course, this is not hitting us equally and at the same time and with the same harshness. And I mean, ultimately, it's us in the G7, G20. I mean, we have basically honestly developed on the expense of all these emissions. I mean, it has not been even China, you know, I mean, now they're, they're catching up, but, but, but it's, it has been basically G7, G20, and this is all European-based because it's our colonies from, you know, 300 years ago, so it's basically all European-based. And we have the responsibility, in principle, to tackle that issue. But, but, of course, it means a lot of hard work. And we, if we have, well, we talk a lot, but we don't have this agreement that we put that First, when we take a decision that has immediate impacts on our societies, on our economies, and, and that's why I say, you know, if you look at the, the political regulatory framework, I mean, Germany currently, you know, we have still, we are still burning lignite. I mean, we are a very advanced country. We are burning lignite. Why are we burning lignite? There is a, there's two regions, which is one is North Rhine-Westphalia, by the way, the other one is in the east. There is, there is the fear of political problems. And this is the problem that we have slept for 25 years because we know since, since Rio that we have to get out of lignite. Nothing has happened. This has continued. Yes, yes, yes. This is part of the cultural identity of the people. So what are we, what are we now doing? You know, now we have a coal commission. Let's see what they come up, whether we can find a consensus. And whether we, but this is, this is then the reality that, 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 that we meet car industry the same, you know? I mean, it's not that Germany, I mean, we're always saying we are leaders in climate change. We cannot agree, you know, to, we are not even innovative in our own car industry because there is a, no regulatory framework and we have never decided that this is a priority. And in the end, if we chuckle, no, even cities are taken to court for air quality, you know, <laughs> the diesel scam. <laughs> we have not, we, we have not seen that, you know? We, cities have now to, to basically keep the cars out and are blamed because we have not managed to keep our car industry innovative by regulating it. And this is, this is where I say where priority comes in. And of course, local level is normally at the end because we, local level does not regulate, you know? But we have to be clear about the priority and we have to have more open discussions about that in, in all levels of politics, you know? Well, I mean, we might still be well off in, in 30 years. Large parts of Africa might less. And then we, then we have, I'm not talking about my, <laughs> migration now, but we have, we have, you know, we have all these, these, issue, these issues on the table. 
And we tend to ignore it because we live now and we live tomorrow, but we don't live in 20 years. Mm-hmm. Okay, the first Anni and then Kimmo, yeah. Mm. I think uh, for, for the first time I ran for parliament in 1998, uh, and my main uh, goal was to uh, influence climate change to reduce, to make Finland to reduce emissions. And I think what I have learned in these 20 years mm. is that... Um, You cannot make climate change uh, priority uh, number one and, and the only priority. But uh, you have to find ways. And of course, now it's more pressing. We see uh, we see California burning. We saw Sweden burning. I mean, we see much more of the impact now than we did 20 years ago. Although we basically actually know the same things. So I think it at least teaches that knowing things does not help that much in politics. Um, it's a good start, but it doesn't get you so, so long, um, to so many steps further. But, but I, I do think that, in a way, um, you have to find ways that you cooperate, that you uh, answer to people's needs uh, so that you solve... Uh, You reduce emissions, you solve uh, climate issues at the same time when you actually solve some other questions that are still, although it's such a burning thing, uh, I do think that you need to somehow hook up things and solve things uh, at the same time. One thing that has been a global success was the uh, uh, the millennium goals. And I, I think there was a, an approach that you did combine both the poverty and the education questions, and I think that kind of approach, you need it if you want to get things done. Kimo. Um, yeah. Actually, I just noticed that uh, we had same reason to came into politics <laughs> with Anni. In a way, I meant climate. That's good. But I uh, do agree with um, Wolfgang that We have the re- historical responsibility. All developed countries, we have uh, reached our welfare at the expense of environment and climate. And uh, we have uh, also the responsibility to lead the way ahead to solving the problems. But we just, uh, just simply can't afford to let emerging economies do the same mistakes that we have done. Mm-hmm. And uh, that makes uh, it complex. <laughs> We uh, we don't tell them that you have no right to get the welfare for your people, but we should be able to tell them you have right to reach the welfare, but in a sustainable manner. And now it's exactly what uh, Anni mentioned, to combine the targets of Agenda 2030 and Paris Agreement, put them together, Um, I have noticed uh, in several, several meetings with my foreign colleagues, uh, especially in developing countries, that uh, they have need to combine these. And we have to understand needs for the developing countries that they are uh, trying to get at least near the same welfare that they see we share at the moment, but uh, help them to do it in climate-friendly, sustainable way. Okay, now we have 10 minutes more to go before the lunch break. So, uh, if audience has something to ask, uh, just uh, one moment more, because first we want to hear from Peter. How do we reduce the prices of house <laughs> houses here? <laughs> yeah, I'm listening very carefully. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the rest of the 10 uh, minutes. I'll, no, but I'll, I'll be honest. I don't know so well the Finnish housing market, um, but. At, at, at the core of all housing problems <laughs> is the cost of land and uh, in terms of affordability. And the question then becomes, how can you find a new way to regulate the cost of land? Um, and there are different ways through that nexus, but that is where the focus needs to be, on, on, uh, I, I would argue. And if you want to see one country which managed to do it, but, all, but with an autocracy, uh, this was Singapore, where nearly every Singaporean citizen has their own owned house that was built for them by the state. They can look a bit the same. Uh, and the only the problem for them is that their migrant workers don't have the same uh, housing standards and uh, 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 live in dormitories. But, uh, but seriously, the, the question of how... We, I mean, the land is a form of commons. 
It's one that we use up in cities, and it, we find it very hard to reuse. Uh, so we obviously have to be circular in our thinking about land to a much higher degree uh, than we always have been. We're better than, for example, the United States, which just abandons whole tracts of urban land, say Detroit. Um, so land is at the absolute core, and the question of how we reprice land to reflect the fact that it's us as citizens which gave that land the value. So it's us collectively which make land in the centre more valuable, land in the suburbs. And it's actually a geographical issue because it's, it's highly spatial. But how do we reprice land uh, in, and find an, a new accommodation to do that, I would say, is, is that absolutely at the centre of where the solution is for, for affordable housing. But is that something against free markets? If, if the market sets the price wherever it, wherever it is, then there it is. But we have lots of managed markets. Yeah. Uh, and the question is how, what is the, at the moment we have a form of extractive land economy where a few people extract nearly all the value that we as citizens put into the fact. It's us that makes that land valuable and a few people who extract that value. So we have to re reposition that. And it's, I mean, there would still be a free market in building. That's a different question. Uh, I'm not saying that it should be like Singapore with the state building. I'm saying that you have to take land out of the equation. Anni, did you have something to say on this? Uh... Mm, I just have a comment that I think, uh, well, I certainly do think that uh, markets can be regulated uh, and uh, land market uh, certainly, uh, and in most of the places it's regulated in some way, although uh, in many places not so strongly. Uh, but I would still add to the question of affordable housing that actually uh, also the numbers and the quantity, how much uh, you are able to build uh, in relation to demand uh, has a big role that um, whatever system you have, but if you don't build enough for the needs of the people, then actually someone pays more. And I think a good thing is to um, compare, for example, Helsinki and Stockholm, where Stockholm has built uh, much less housing than Helsinki, although it's a bigger city, and the prices have skyrocketed uh, in Stockholm in the pace that, uh, although in Helsinki it's not cheap to live here and the prices have gone up, but not nearly as the uh, pace that uh, it has happened in Stockholm. And I think that there, there are some other differences as well, but I think just the amount of how much actually there has been built new housing uh, is the biggest uh, explanator. Mm -hmm. I could just comment. To, I think uh, Stockholm has made a, a huge mistake really during the last years because Stockholm used to own the land, and they were renting out the land, and there were a lot of public, comp public housing companies for public housing, that, and that was the same in England, that could really produce these rental apartments in an affordable way for many, many years. Then the, local, the government decided, or the local municipality decided, to sell out the land. It, it, and also, and through that, now we have a lack of, of, of housing, of affordable housing. So that was a politics and, and really the short-term economy that really turned the whole, the whole house, housing market into something which is not very decent. It's a lot of problems. So by, by if it's possible to own the land, as you said, because this price of land is so important, and to lend out uh, the, the land rather than to sell it, then it's, you will still have the possibility to have the advantage of how you should uh, really uh, develop. The, the so, it's not a, so it's not about the mortgage thing, which we often say here no, in Finland. No, not from the different. beginning. Yeah, no. okay. Yeah, yeah, welcome. It, and then, uh, Mario, yeah. Maybe just, just two, two quick comment, uh, comments. I mean, I, I think one is because you would be, in many cities around the world, be astonished who, who ultimately owns the city because it's not local. Mm. It's, you know, I mean, London is owned by the world but not by Londoners. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not definitely not, not, you know, in any way a nationalist. But I mean, if we come, if we come to control of commons, and this is land, this is water, you know, yeah. then we have to be very careful about, you know, to whom and brings you who controls the commons. And land in many cities around the world is not in any way locally controlled. As soon as you start to sell it, it's internationally on the market. And we have currently a market that is fueled by cheap money. 
So that's, there's too much money around. This makes it really unaffordable. The second point, because when we say the, the, the needs of people, I'm, I'm, I have a, a very big question mark to that. There is maybe 25 to 30% of the society that have a need. We, you and me, we are the ones. You say you are, you know, you have a place that is bigger. I have a place that is bigger. So we have, we have the opportunity to have it. But we should, because we, we, the demand per capita is increasing, 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 because we are wealthy societies, but we should also sociologically ask, why, why do we need more space around us? Because we cannot bear each other due to many other factors. We need, we need space around us, particularly in our private life. And I think this is, this is a factor that we should not ignore. Whether this is a need or a want, we can discuss, but the large part is also driven by want and by opportunity. Yeah, maybe uh, to add, uh, I don't know if it's only about regulation and only owning the land, but, but what I would like to bring into this is that it, it's one, definitely a city-regional question. If we take seriously the region that there is, for instance, in, in Helsinki, in Stockholm, and, and understand the emerging centralities and the accessibilities and the best locations, we can bring millions and millions more people without losing the qualities. And I think that's a challenge for us researchers to show the, the, the potential and, 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 and bring new locations and new centralities into the discussion. And then we can provide uh, with all the other uh, elements. And, and also, I think, the construction field. We, they have to start doing research and development. It, it's the, the curve is flat, so it, 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 it's not enough of just annexing the space from people and, and shrinking the living qualities. Okay, uh, unfortunately, the lunch is served now, but uh, <laughs> I'm just checking, is there anything to ask? Any questions from the audience? Just uh, raise your hand if you have a... Okay, there is one. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, there is the microphone as well. Good. Just a fast, easy question. I'm Kathy Lindros from Urban Practice. I would like to first our international guests to answer. Um, Finland is taking the EU presidency next year. And uh, what are your hopes? What is the outcome of this uh, our time? What we are hosting? Will there be a Helsinki Pact? What are you looking forward to? Well, to come back, no, but uh, I think, uh, as I said before, uh, I saw something here yesterday, which I think could be also an imagination of how uh, Helsinki can be in the future. When I went to this Amos Rex, the new future museum uh, here in Helsinki, where you combine the new technology in the uh, massless, the exhibition, but also how the public place, the realm, was used for everybody. I saw these people lay, laying on the floor, uh, talking, eating, and also how this uh, brave initiative really combined this old cinema with this new future uh, museum. And I think that's something with Helsinki, and uh, uh, because you are a very brave nation, and I believe very much that having this flat organization as you do here, have here, I think there are a lot of initiatives that could come from here that could be highly fresh that we haven't seen before, which is, of course, the com com combination of, of uh, decision-making. You said that people were talking to each other. Where were they from? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know where they were from, but this is the atmosphere. This is what, you know, there's something nice with this. I uh, listened once to the... Um, a landscape architect in New York who's responsible for all the national parks. And he said something that I really kept in mind since then, and that is the public realm, the parks, are not just created to be healthy, they are created because these are uh, the memories uh, of, of us. That's how we create public space, and this is the memory that we keep with us. So the memory is quite... Maybe, maybe it's think. just me, because if I see that my neighbor goes to the elevator, I'm waiting there <laughs> with, my, with my door and look at the, from the, you know, the door eye, and then when he goes, then I can go to the <laughs> elevator. <laughs> <laughs> Only you had, uh, and then Kimmo, yeah. 
just a um, short comment. One thing that I'm uh, hoping to uh, present to people uh, who come to Helsinki to meetings and whatever uh, they come during the presidency, I think one thing that I, I'm hoping Helsinki could be an inspiration is like where we are now in Jatkasari, that it's new part of town, uh, and that if you see from here, there are city-owned regulated rental housing, there is regulated student housing, uh, there are buildings that are completely free market and actually that did cost a lot, uh, and there are some uh, mid-forms uh, of uh, not so regulated but still not completely free market. So it's all kinds of people, both young and old and families, uh, with different background, be it elsewhere in Finland, be it elsewhere in the world, and there will be one good school uh, in this area, and families and children from really different families uh, will uh, have their children in that same school. And uh, that is something that I'm uh, willing to show to people uh, as an example of this city. Okay, then this is beautiful because, Kimmo, you, you made the opening words, and now you can do the closing <laughs> words here. Uh, thank you, actually. Anni described so beautiful scene <laughs> to show to our foreign visitors that uh, there's nothing to compete with that. But uh, uh, the government takes very seriously the implementation of Agenda 2030 as whole. And uh, I wish that we can uh, emphasize somehow the need to implementation of Agenda 2030 at EU level as well, not only in sustainable urban uh, development, but throughout the European Union policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we're having a lunch break, and uh, uh, it's about 45 minutes, so uh, 15 to 1 we will continue here, and uh, that will be in Finnish. We focus on Finnish perspective. You can obviously stay if you like to. Do, do you speak Finnish? Probably not, but... It's interesting anyway, yeah. So, now lunch and then uh, we'll continue after 45 minutes.